Hello and welcome to Mr. Clark After Dark, everyone. My name is Lucas Clark and I am a certified educator with Alberta Education and the Alberta Teachers Association. All conversations and interactions exchange is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. In no way does the content discussed intend to be in violation of the ATA Code of Conduct or meant to target any individual student, teacher, or to belittle or demean the profession in any way. If you have something that you would like me to discuss or have a story of your own to share, please reach out at lucasrdclark97 at gmail.com. You can also send a direct message to me on Instagram at Mr. Clark After Dark. Hope you enjoy the show and please do not forget to subscribe. And now, on to the show. Hope you all enjoy. Hello, friends. On today's podcast, I have on the one and only Kelly Haldane. Kelly Haldane is currently a junior high humanities teacher who has been in the profession for more than a decade. On part one of the episode here today, Kelly and I discuss the utility of our university education, her experience working in a women's shelter in Edmonton, teaching in Kenya, and the machete surprise that she experienced when the students had to create their own track and actually ended up having a chance encounter with some Kenyan Olympians. She also discussed her experience teaching in England, as well as the riot that occurred in her school while she she was teaching there, the different treatment experienced by male versus female teachers, drowning in work during the early years, how teachers place guilt on one another, how she balanced teaching with being a new mother, and much more. Thank you all for tuning in and hope you all enjoy the show. Hello, Kelly. How's Hi. life? Good. It's yeah. good. It's busy. It's yeah. teacher life. It's teacher really life. How many years in the profession now for you? Um, crap. Um, I graduated in 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know what that math is, but like I had a few years off. I yeah. dabbled in a few other things. Like what? Um, when we first moved to Alberta, mm-hmm. I actually worked for the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters. Okay. Um, okay. I worked in their main office. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of their like admin stuff. So where and was this? Edmonton. 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 Okay. Uh, I took care of their silent witness program. Okay. Helped plan their big events. It was. Great. So what kind of big events would they kind of put on? To help so with that? they had their AGM. So all of their shelter members would come down, mm-hmm. and um, they would meet for couple days yeah. at a time um and so that had its own like kind of unique logistics we have shelters like in way way northern alberta like yeah. Fort chip where women yeah. were coming from really isolated communities and they needed like certain kind of s- special help things like they so, didn't necessarily have credit cards and so putting a you know a security deposit for their hotel wasn't an option for them and we had to work with companies that would okay. work with them a lot. So. What were some of like the major things you learned from that? Because I find we often get like credit for a soft skill set, mm. I guess, as teachers. But did you find anything kind of helped from what you did in university to translate to that? Um. Well, I did have a minor in gender equality and social justice, which okay. is a mouthful. So yeah. um, I, I knew a lot about kind of like that general area and statistic wise, but okay. that yeah. opportunity gave me uh the time to get to know the people who mm-hmm. were involved in things like that so it was a little bit unique yeah yeah and so when did you graduate university uh was- so i finished my ba in 2007 mm-hmm. my b.ed in 2008 oh, okay and what did you like kind of study you said that you had a minor but what did you kind of like, so, what, was teaching kind of always your goal or <laughs> i fell into it like face yeah. first yeah. Um, as I feel like as most people do. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure about it, but um, I finished my high school years in Ontario. I was the last of the grade 13s. Okay, so what is that? So, I've heard that many times and because I upgraded for a full year, so I usually joke that I said that I did grade 13, but I know. We, yeah. we actually had grade 13. It was yeah. called OAC, Ontario Academic Credits. Okay. So... If you were somebody who was planning to jump into the workforce or do a trade or go to college, you didn't Mm. have to do grade 13. Okay. So it was optional. Yeah. Okay. Is it kind of like CJEP? 
Quebec? Is yeah, that kind of similar. A similar? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then if you want to go to university, you had to get your OAC credits. Okay. So you did an extra year. Mm -hmm. And then, so we were the last of the official grade 13 kids. Okay. And um, Lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it gave me more time to grow up. I was a September baby, so I was going to university at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. If I had gone the year before, I would have been 17. Do you imagine yeah. this nonsense I would have gotten into as a 17-year-old well, on and her so own? so my wife was... Four months into her, because like she graduated university at 21, because mm. she finished grade 12, but then she doesn't, her birthday's late in November. Yeah. So she literally was like, so now she's not even 27 and she's going into her sixth year of teaching, which is insane. That is. But I found, like you said, for the, when I did the, because I did six years of uni, like after I did upgrading, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I found, if anything, even if I didn't learn anything in those six years in university, it was nice to have some separation. Yeah. And some time to actually like moderately mature, if you can say that what I am now is mature. <laughs> but <laughs> I know, I've... So I've been told that I'm the staff golden retriever. And I, <laughs> you, you do have puppy vibes. You, I, do. you know what? I feel like there's worse things. But mm -hmm. So how long have you been up in Fort McMurray now teaching? Uh, we're here officially this weekend, nine years. Okay. So why the move here? Uh, my husband got a yeah. job here. We Classic. moved to Alberta because he got a position right out of university with Suncor. And then oh, okay. uh, we were in Edmonton for a couple of years and um, they offered him a job up here. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, let's not do that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, it'll only be a couple of years. So yeah, we came five on year a three-year plan. Three year plan. Course, yeah. Nine years later, I'm still here. Yeah. So you guys are pretty much thinking like long haul now? Heck no. Or? Heck no. <laughs> no, I'm still dreaming about getting out. Yeah. So where about? Like where would you want to go? Is the amazing, that's amazing. I don't know. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know. Um, yeah. Families in Ontario don't have any desire to go back. There. I hate Ontario. I don't know what it is. I'm such an Ontario <laughs> hater. Hume, hume, hume. <laughs> I, I don't know. Some people are like. I can live in a little square and take the subway every single day, like in downtown Toronto. I get like overwhelmed. I don't know when I get into big cities. I don't know. What do you think? Do you? I, are you I love a good city vibe. You love a I good do. city vibe. So yeah. what? Are, what is it about it? It feels alive. Okay. You know, like yeah, and you just feel like you're part of something that's always moving and not all cities yeah. are the same though it's kind you of know? part of a bigger network rather yeah. than just like a small town somewhere that's very stagnant yeah. i guess yeah 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 that's so it. you know i love uh london lived in england for a while and i yeah. i just really love that city so much oh, okay. or um vancouver's a nice city i enjoy See, it there vancouver but we driving went to... is scary it is intense <laughs> you could be a little aggressive yeah yeah that's yeah. what you're gonna say about vancouver um it's it's kind of the perfect option for us in terms of if we stay in Canada. It's yeah. the weather. It has all the mountains and ocean activities, outdoorsy stuff, and then also you know the city is there and all. The so mountains. would you not live in Canada? Like would you? Move oh yeah, yeah? I'd, I'd leave. Yeah. Where would you go? I've hemmed and hawed about New Zealand. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have never been there, but yeah. I don't know. It gives me good vibes. Yeah. I'd go back to England in a heartbeat. So when did you live in England? Uh, right out of university. I left university. I went to Kenya for a while. Okay. And taught there for a bit. And then worked with some women in um, like working on building businesses and stuff. Okay. So okay, so you have women shelters in Edmonton. You have Kenya and yeah. you have London. So what is the timeline here? Which one comes first? Uh, first Kenya. First Kenya. I, I, okay. I left university and, yeah. and finished and then went, okay, let's go So Kenya. why Kenya. Like uh, there was a there? program with my university. We had originally been planning to go in February. Yeah. It didn't work out. Um, there was some political issues. So we ended up going after at the end of our school year. Okay. And uh, I loved it. Okay. We were in rural Masai Mara, okay. middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, we stayed with the Kipsigi. And I, yeah, I lived in a tent and there was a bush baby next to us. And there was... So what do you mean by a bush baby? Like, they're like these like little... I think they're an, a monkey of some sort. <laughs> and they just, they they stay, they're nocturnal. And they yeah. make this awful sound like a crying baby at night. Okay. Like, all night long. I wanted to kill them. <laughs> um, but that's, I guess, how it survives. Okay. And so yeah. how long are you in Kenya for? 
a couple months. Okay. Yeah. And are you teaching there? Like, I did some you teaching. Yeah, yeah. I okay. taught standard four. I had standard four. Standard four. Okay. I had fifty-four students, so that's like grade three. Yes, I think it would work out to. Oh, okay. And I trained yeah. high school, so I did my bachelor of education was in, um, yeah, intermediate senior, so okay. grade eight to twelve. Okay. And then they gave me grade three. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. And then there was 54 of them in the room. I was like... So just you and 54 students. I'm going to die. I had a teaching partner. Okay. So, um, and he was also high school. But okay. We got what we got. So So how did you like find resources? Like, what did you do? Like, what was... Like, you walk in, we you're prepping for day one. What does that look like? Ooh. Like, what are the... <laughs> day six, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Day one was was... Um, we colored a lot. Okay. No, but uh, that, like, brought you know what? a big bag of crayons and some yeah. paper and just we colored. Yeah. So was it like a pretty like poor community? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, when we got there, their teach their regular teacher was there, but mm -hmm. for the rest of the time she didn't show up because the teachers weren't being paid at that time. So they just didn't come to school because, you know, it, it took her about two hours to get to school each way. Um, and why would you do that if you're not getting paid? Yeah, like, well, how do you do it, right? Like, right. even, but... You can't. Yeah, and so... So, yeah. uh, we took over, basically, uh, us and 54 kids. Um, they have, like, a standardized textbook because the kids at the end of each year would take a standardized test that was... Every single year? ...the same mm -hmm, across the entire country. It was very, like, very much like the British system. Yeah. Um, which makes sense because yeah. they had been colonized. Yeah. And, um... So we were to prepare them for these exams, but we had like one textbook for 54 kids and um, no resources to go with it. It was like the most worn out book. I've so like what did you do? Like how did you end up? A lot of improvising, a yeah. lot of like we did a plant unit. So we went outside and we dug up some plants and we talked about what roots are. But yeah. these kids were Kipsigi. They spoke Kipsigi. They had just recently started to speak... Um, Swahili. Okay. And the year before they started to learn English half days. So we had to learn some Swahili <laughs> to translate into English so that we could communicate with each other. It was... Wow. Yeah. Holy. But they were the sweetest things. Like you, yeah. you think like 54 kids in a room. Yeah. Heck no. But yeah. I walked in the room every morning and they all stood like at attention. Like I was the president or something. And they'd say, good morning. Ma'am, in unison, <coughs> in perfect unison. So they were like these perfect, I mean, they weren't perfect little angels. They yeah, were yeah. a little mischievous. Well, yeah. They were still eight, graders, right? right? Yeah. Um, and then one day I walked in and I walked in the door and they did their usual stand up and I looked up at the ceiling because we had rafters. It was like a yeah. mud hut, yeah. really. And it was filled with machetes. And I thought, this is the day. This is the day they kill me. <laughs> Wait, so where did the machetes come from? They Why? had been told to bring in tools because we were having a, a regional track meet and they had to create the track. So every kid, <laughs> we had we had class in the morning. I kid you not, we had class in the morning and then they had their lunch. The mamas come from the village and made their lunch. Every kid had to bring uh, like a bucket of water and two sticks and the mamas would come and make their lunch for them. They had their lunch. And then we made a track. They went out with their machetes and made this perfect, I kid you not, perfect track. And then kids next yeah. day came from all, a whole bunch of schools all over. And these two guys who literally were on the Olympic team for running yeah. came and like paced them in my life. Oh my gosh. Like out of nowhere. There out was nowhere. no like big to do about it. Nobody yeah. talked about it beforehand. There was no preparation. Wow. You just, they just showed up. Wow. Yeah. And just built so like a 400 meter track just out of. With machetes. With <laughs> a bunch of kids with machetes. <laughs> so you're only there for about four months. Is it like a semester kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. it wasn't even like I was about a couple weeks and then I just ended up staying for a while. Okay. Hanging out and didn't want to go back. But so Ontario, why why Ontario government. It was so beautiful. Yeah. And peaceful. Yeah. And like the, they didn't have much. Mm -hmm. but they didn't need much, right? Like, 
the kids had food in their belly yeah. and they had parents who loved them yeah. and they had a goat outside that made milk and some people had more than others, but like yeah. they would share, you know, if your neighbor was missing, like didn't have any rice for their meal, you yeah. brought them rice. It was like a real community. Wow. And so yeah. how big was the community you were in? Because like you said, so it's 54 students in just like a grade. That doesn't seem very small. Yeah. Community, so right? like but. they would have come from like other areas around as well. Okay. So our particular village, I want to say it was about 400 people. Oh, uh, okay. Quite small. So Yeah, okay. Yeah. Lots of kids though. Okay. And so how did that track meet end up going? Like, uh, how was it? Like, how are you... <laughs> Well, because I'm wondering if you cut this through a bush, like, how are you seeing that they're going all the way around? Like, I'm trying to picture it. It it was amazing. Like, it was just like a regular track, but it was just chopped out with... With (laughs) And yeah, and then the Olympic guys came and they took their shoes off to do the run. Okay. Ran without shoes. All the kids ran without shoes. Even if they had shoes, if they were going out to run or to like kick the soccer ball around, they took the shoes off. Wow. Do you remember the Olympians' names at all or no? No, no not a clue. Just, They're just like, oh, yeah, they're here. <laughs> yeah, those guys are here. Yeah. Because like the long distance running, I find like from that area of the world is just, they kill it every single year. Right. Every year, they're just, it's like for some reason, that sport, they're just all the time. Yeah. So you finish in Kenya. Yeah. And then you come back to Ontario. And yeah, and there's like no work and it's boring and I didn't want to get stuck in small town Pembroke. So I was yeah. like... <laughs> England, you are my friend. And off I went. I uh, worked in Southampton okay. in a brand new school. Sounds very bougie. <laughs> it, it does, Southampton. Well, it's where the um, uh, it, they have a port. So like a lot of the cruise ships go in there and stuff. Yeah, okay. I lived in an apartment and right behind me was the world's oldest lawn bowling um, Lawn place. bowling? Lawn bowling. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, like right around the corner was this like old falling down remnants of like the fortress that was there like it, it was very old yeah. Lindy. but like very cool very that sounds cool. awesome <laughs> it was it was good times um and i taught yeah at this academy and it was i ended up meeting a lot of what we call my foreign family there okay yeah. a bunch of a uh, couple of canadians bunch of australians um we took in one british guy okay <laughs> one of the locals <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, an American friend of mine who's become one of my best buddies and she she and I got mistaken for each other a lot. So okay. we yeah. were interchangeable. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just taught there for a bit and it was crazy. We had a riot. Um, yeah. What is this riot? <laughs> so, the riots the in Southampton. <laughs> we had a riot. So it, the school was on two sites because it was really two schools that they were merging together as an academy okay academies at the time were becoming a thing in england which is like really they were taking schools and privatizing them um so we were becoming this academy and um on our kind of senior site i had a lot of kids who were unhappy with the way things were going and some of their issues were valid Mm -hmm. you know they were concerned about what kind of education they were getting and and they were not feeling like they were being heard and they wanted to see the headmaster and they weren't given the opportunity to so what were some of their main concerns um they felt like so part of their issue was that they didn't like the change from their old school to the new school okay yeah um, and that wasn't necessarily, they needed to give that a chance. Yeah. Um, but some of their stuff, like they thought that they weren't getting the same resources that they were when their school had been a, a public school. Okay. Um, they weren't getting, um, their class sizes had changed. They'd gotten bigger mm-hmm. um, and they were crowded and things were pretty disorganized to start with. Okay. I don't know if you've ever, or no, you probably, you haven't experienced the startup of a new school. No. It's, it's chaos. Okay. Yeah. Um, no matter how many people are working to get rid and of no it. No matter how much experience. It is, it it's is just hard. A, Yeah. You have a whole new. Yeah. Um, and so, and the company's kind of policies on some stuff, like, I'm trying to think. So there's a company that owns the school? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. They were an organization. Okay. Um, and they, they had like a nonprofit side and a profit side. And it was all. Okay. It was, it was very much like a drink the Kool-Aid kind of thing, right? Like, okay. What do you mean by drink <laughs> like, the Kool-Aid? You know, like, like buying into kind of the okay. cheesy yeah. Yeah. nonsense stuff. Yeah, <laughs> What I call it in my yeah. attitude problem. But yeah. um, <laughs> so 
yeah, they weren't happy. I said, you know what, you you make, of course, I had to be part of this, right? Yeah. I was said, you know, you should make a petition. You get yeah. enough people to sign your petition and yeah. say you have these concerns and you want them addressed, and I'll bring it to the headmaster for yeah. you. I don't care. Yeah. So they made their petition, <laughs> but then some, like, less credible humans got involved. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you go from, like, you know, the, the academic kids who are concerned about yeah. having enough attention for their work to the less academic kids who are just there to Fry have it. some fun. <laughs> so yeah, so they literally got out of, up out of their classrooms one day and they poured into the hallway and they poured into the courtyard and they just started destroying things. Oh yeah, I mean like, yeah, trash cans all over the place, paint on the walls, breaking glass, pulling down doors, just holy shit there was like a stampede of them through the hallway oh god yeah i, I could see it still <laughs> so like did anyone get hurt in this was no there... one got hurt um they were eventually able to like get them all out of the building so did it just like ex escalate extremely quickly it did okay. like in a flash it just got crazy pulling the fire alarms oh man yeah it was crazy <laughs> so <laughs> um and then nothing, and then they didn't really address the kids' problems then because they yeah. didn't see them as valid now, right? They were like, you're just causing problems. Yeah. So it was on the news. It was good times. That's hilarious. Yeah. I have still wow. the news clippings at home. So um, got through that. That was like, I don't even know if it was October at that point. Like, it Oh, my was gosh. Crazy. So this is your first year there? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so you don't like know really these kids from their previous school. They're just... Kind of coming They're in, all new. ready to tear something ready, up. <laughs> ready to what grade is this? Uh, so this would have been what would be years. Because they call it year. Year, yeah, year six, 10, yeah, 10 and eleven. Wow. So, yeah. So nine, ten, eleven on that side. So like, how private was that school? Because like, I know that might be a stupid question, but I know it, I've never heard of a transition of public schools to private schools, and I'm wondering. Like, how much would they have had to pay versus before? You know what? Do you know like, what um, the difference I don't think they been? had to pay tuition. Okay. Um, it was simply that the public school system could no longer afford to run the building. And so oh. they sold it to this company. And then they were just going to use that as part of their business model, I guess. Oh, okay. But they paid for their, I think, their uniform, but that was it. Classic. Yep. Nice. So how long are you in London for? I teaching? stayed there for a year and got the heck out. Okay. So why? It was just too crazy. Well, it was, yeah, it clearly. Was really, <laughs> I mean, after that, our head headmaster was dismissed. She she clearly couldn't do the job. Yeah. And we ended up with these two other headmasters. So they and they had one for each site. But then they didn't like one of them. And he was amazing. He was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Um, so they booted him and then so they just had the one. Why do you think they didn't like him? Like why do you think like because he told them flat out that they were doing it wrong okay, and that they needed to ch make changes or else it wasn't going to be successful. And he was right. They ended up being a school. So in England, they have this kind of organization that comes in and um, audits schools. And if they're not performing, and I mean like everything. So um, teacher lesson plans have to be turned into them. They look at what work the students are doing and how they're doing on it and assess it at a national level. They look at their exams. They look at the way the offices are running, like everything. Mm -hmm. So, and then they're given a score. And if you're a failing school, you then are basically put on this like watch system. And for an X amount of years, I don't remember how long it is, um, you, your school then has to go through this like long process of like getting it together. Wow. And you, you put in your lesson plans like every day to these wow. random bodies of people and they make sure that you're doing your job. It's very like Intimidating. Big Brother is watching. Yes, seriously. And so they end up becoming a failing school. Mm -hmm. um, so thank God I got out of there. Yeah, and so you didn't want to like explore anywhere else in England or were you kind of just... No, I was kind of really jaded about the whole place. Yeah. Um, and to go back now, like with some experience, I'd be yeah. fine. But as a brand new teacher and I was there and we were kind of left kind of just to figure, figure it out. out. Yeah. Um, I was with an organization like that hired me 
So the school hired me through this organization mm -hmm. that hires Canadian teachers. So they were really good. Um, but to do it again, now as a, as a grown-up teacher, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, fine, whatever, I don't care. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, the behavior problems and the stuff I saw there then is a lot of what I'm experiencing now. So okay. um, it's almost like it just followed me back. Okay, so when it comes to the behavior stuff, because, I mean, I'm still obviously fairly new, but when it comes to how the behavior is similar, has it gotten worse? Like, what is what is it that's similar about it that you're dealing with? Um, I think it's the way we manage it. Okay, so who's we? And the like, whole you, system. Yeah. You know, parents. Um, admin, teachers. I like that you started with parents. Yeah. With system there. But yeah. Right. It, it, that's yeah. where it starts, right? Yeah. We need to hold our kids accountable. I was I was just telling my students the other day when I was asking them to just simply put Chromebooks away. Yeah. Uh, you you have to understand that you, you are responsible for your own things. And if you yeah. take something out, you put it away. Even my own son, and he's six, yeah. is responsible yeah. to put things away is he perfect yeah. no no he's sick he's sick <laughs> but you know i really do make it a priority so like it starts at home your expectations in the home carry over in all aspects of their life mm -hmm. so if you're not teaching them to be respectful if you're not teaching them to be responsible for their own actions then they're not gonna be like that at school either yeah and so uh, and another thing you always hear is well, there's only so much you can do at school if they're not being like maintained or there's no consistency at home as mm -hmm. well. And again, certain kids are going to have certain scenarios where that's not possible. And yeah. we do our best to deal with that accordingly. Um, but I've had this question a few times of I, it seems more and more difficult. Like the students have more control or agency in kind of choosing their punishment. Would, mm -hmm. would I be right in saying that? Yeah. And so... One of the things I've kind of struggled with is how do I maintain discipline in my classroom or to discipline a student mm -hmm. if there really is no fear of repercussions? Yeah. Like, how do you kind of go? How have you adjusted? Or like, is there how? <laughs> go home and cry. <laughs> um, like, I how has classroom management changed, like, with this kind of new kind of student-centered, like, punishment stuff? For me personally, yeah. I really work to keep control of it. Mm -hmm. I very rarely send kids to the office mm -hmm. because I don't know what's going to happen when they get there. Yeah. And I don't like them. Um, so I very much work to keep everything in my own hands. Yeah. And you need to get to know the kids and know what is going to scare them, quite frankly. Yeah. Is it a phone call home? Yeah. Okay. I will use it. Yeah. Um, but if that idea of a phone call home is not going to scare them, then yeah. let's face it, some of them don't care. Yeah. Um, and I have made phone calls home and the parents are like, whatever, F you. <laughs> Sounds pretty normal. Literally, yeah. F you. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much for your support. <laughs> <laughs> Click. Go home, cry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just really work on keeping it within my control and not okay. letting somebody else take the reins. I mean, yeah. obviously, the big things you have to. Yes. Like, some things um, need to be, like, reported, I guess. Yeah. But, and then yeah. you really need to make sure that you're happy with with how that goes. And yeah. and speak your mind. Like, if you, you're not happy with the way something is handled by your administrators, tell them. Yeah. You, you, you are – it's okay to do that. Yeah. In a respectful manner, obviously. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I know. Because we even had the conversation the other day with someone about – the difference of assertive mm -hmm. and aggressive versus compelling. Like there's mm -hmm. a way to go about having those hard conversations. I'm still very much trying to learn how to do that myself as a very agreeable person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been what I'm gathering that there is no correct answer to that question. You yeah. just have to, it, it is very person by person based in terms of how you're actually going to instill discipline in someone it's almost like you don't want to discipline them you want them to learn to discipline themselves it's kind of yeah. what i'm seeing well, yeah. but especially with like our class sizes and how many people there are in it you can't micromanage that no. all the time there needs to be a point where the kids have to follow the rules for the sake of everybody else in the room yeah 
And so what I kind of tell my students, like, I get it. You're going to have an off day where you're not paying attention to me. And yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Like in the, in the grand scheme of things, yeah. I am not going to be constantly on you about that because I don't have time. Yeah. I'm going to prioritize the people who do want to do yeah. well yeah. and do want to get through it. And when you want to jump on board with us, that's great. But until yeah. then, just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> really? Like flat out. And in junior high, you have to say things like that to them. You yeah. have to be blunt. Yes. And I've noticed that, especially you, with the junior high. If but. you fluff around too much with the, the sweetness, and like they they will yeah. walk all do you, over do you. Do you ever tell your classes to just shut up? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I do yeah. all the time. Yeah. Just shut up. <laughs> like, just, guys, just shut up. I am like, done just, now. <laughs> like, I need to talk. Like, yeah. I don't care if you aren't paying attention. Yeah. Just stop Put being your a dick. Down, <laughs> like, take your nap. Whatever. Yeah. I need to communicate. <laughs> yeah. So one of the other things I've, so it's actually funny that you mentioned that about the parents literally saying F you on the phone. <laughs> but one of the things I've noticed for myself is how differently male and female teachers are treated by their students. So what are your thoughts on that? It's ridiculous. <laughs> God, it drives me insane. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. We are 100% treated differently. And so what do you mean? Like, what is, what, are we, what, um, are, what is meant by different? I feel like um, male staff can have a much more relaxed demeanor with their classes and maintain a level of control and that I, I can't do. Mm -hmm. I actually sometimes have to come out like a banshee. Yeah. And and I do start my year off like very firm. Mm -hmm. And eventually as I get to know certain classes, we might relax on a few things, but I do talk to them very, very flat like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, like, yeah, like I said, like male staff can have this much more relaxed. And then when they do turn it on, all heads spin. And I'm like, why can't I do that? Like... <laughs> I am. I have had kids be like, "Miss, you're kind of scary." <laughs> it's like there's a reason. Thank you. That is what I'm it's going a manufactured for. Manufactured scariness. <laughs> it is. I'm not actually like a mean person or anything, but sometimes I just have to act like I am. Well, and so that's like you. I always hear the oh that like female teacher is such a <laughs> you know what. And I'm like they're actually the nicest person alive. It's mm -hmm. Like you just don't pay attention and yeah. you give them shit. Yeah. That is what is different. So you don't get my nice. Yeah. Yeah. And but I have noticed. I'll have all these conversations conversations sometimes and it'll be about a certain student and I'm like, I never get that. Yeah. I don't know. And now I'm not saying, but I've legitimately wondered at people who I'm very close with who we will have completely different perceptions of the same student mm -hmm. but just because of how different they act in our classes. Yeah. So that to me has been an eye opener. And I don't know if there's a way even to bring it up. I don't know if there's a way to accommodate that or what is the path toward trying to make sure. Cause I know I'm like, I'm a, I'm a bigger person anyway, but is that part of it is like a size thing? Like on average, I don't know what it is. Cause I've always been equally scared of all my teachers, but now I feel like there's no fear at all at like at all. In no. mine, but uh, I don't know. What, I don't know what the answer is there. Maybe it is like a size factor. Um, like an maybe intimidation Maybe I just need to thing. like really start doing some seriously heavy weight lifting. <laughs> um. Just on your door is the big picture. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Set the tone a little bit. Uh, um, don't turn it off. I don't care. Um, so that's so. But again, another thing I find it comes from you typically see the female as like a maternal role, et cetera. That's part of the reason I, I would assume most students interact that way. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions I had was, how did teaching change for you after becoming a mom? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's a different world. Yeah. Um, so before, you know, it was okay for me to spend hours at school afterwards planning all the funsy things mm -hmm. and, um, going in on weekends and all of that. And it's not an option anymore. Yeah. Flat out. So I had Emmett and, um, he was a fire baby, right? So, okay, um, yeah. after the fire and I never, I didn't go back. I, well, I went back kind of subbed a little bit here and there okay. September and he was born in October and um and then afterwards I was like no nope. he's he was turning one and I'm like I can't do it I can't leave him it wasn't in the cards for me so yeah. I stayed off 
And I didn't go back until I would have gone back probably when he was four and sent him to ECDP, but then mm. COVID. So yeah. we we're like, don't want to deal with that. Yeah. So went back when he went when it's five. Okay. And so you were so I've only been back a couple of years now. Okay. And it feels incredibly different. Mm. Um and that part of that is because I'm a mom. Yeah. Um and my poor priority is my child, of course. not somebody yeah. else's. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I care about my students and I want them to be successful and yeah. happy and healthy and all those things. But at the end of the day, if like something crazy is going down, I'm the first person out the door. I'm yeah. going to get my kid. Yes. You know, yeah. um, sorry, but yeah. <laughs> everyone no, else no. can deal with and it. And because, well, I guess my question there is <laughs> it seems more and more there's the conversation of teachers are burning out faster. There's a teacher shortage. No one else wants to be in the profession anymore, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it seems apparent that if there is an adjustment you can make, because obviously anyone who becomes a parent has to make an immediate adjustment to how much time they're putting in because you have a whole other life you're now responsible for. Yeah. But what were some of the things that were, okay, I don't need to do this anymore. Because I'm, I'm trying to think of things that are kind of universally potentially possible for people to trim to make the job easier on themselves, not even when they have, when not even just when they become a parent. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Uh, saying no to more things. Mm -hmm. Um, because the workload is already crazy and there's yeah. no adjustments being made for that. Yeah. When I started, um, you know, I was in high school really, but, uh, teaching high school, I mean, and you know, I had to prep every single day, every single day. And it never was taken away. I don't know if it like where that came from. Yeah. It was a shock to me when I came here and they were like, oh, I lost my prep today. How did I lose my prep? So where were you teaching before? So, you know, when I was doing my student teaching, even yeah. in Ontario, had to prep every single day. So I, I taught three blocks and had one every day to prep. Mm -hmm. um, and as a student teacher, that was not enough because you're not. Yeah, you're dying. There. You're dying. Yeah. You're drowning. You're supposed to be drowning, though. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah. It's okay to drown a little bit at the beginning. Yeah. So what do you mean by drown? Like, what was the like, benefits of drowning? <laughs> not, the, <laughs> not the benefits of drowning, but the benefits of going through that kind of rite of passage. Right. I guess. Um that is a really good question. Mm -hmm. And now I'm stalling to think. No, uh, no, because honestly, because I'll well, I'll share my experience. And I don't yeah. want this to sound I have been given how do I say this? Everything has been put in a place for me to be successful since I've started, which I find is not always the case. Right. Like when it came to my two practicums, both practicums I did were here in, mm -hmm. in Fort McMurray, not at McTavish, but um, the first one was during COVID. So my, my mentor teacher was, you do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Like you can teach as much as you want, but like she was very, like I know we have our standard kind of, you gradually take on more of the class and I still did that, Yeah. but it was, she said, I'm still surviving. We don't know. Like of the five weeks, we had a week and a half of everyone in the room. And then the other three weeks intermittently, like week by week, it was different of if we were in school or not. Yeah. So she said, ask as many questions as you want. We'll figure it out. So I would do some stuff. And I actually kind of took over for her grade eights for social. Yeah. So, but even in taking over for the grade eights for social, one thing I've noticed is that everything's on a Google Drive now. Yeah. So you have a lot of the resources are kind of put in place for yeah. you, which is extremely nice. Yeah. And I, especially coming here, because I found McTavish is, if not anything, extremely organized. Yeah. From my perspective, for social anyway, because I literally came in and they said, okay, I'm going to share you this drive. And it has all our chapters, all our notes, all our tasks, all our booklets. And yeah. in my second practicum, I only taught social. And all I took in university was all social studies related stuff. Okay. So I felt pretty genuinely prepared for it. Yeah. And then now in like last year, I pretty much took on everything because also doing all social studies again, we had all the tests created. We had all, most of the legwork was kind of done for you. Mm -hmm. And so but I, I don't feel like I drowned but is that like a so what do you think that did for you that kind of made you a better teacher um 
I built a really strong work ethic, mm -hmm. which I mean, I was always that kid anyway. I did a double yeah. major and yeah. I was always a bit of an overachiever, yeah. um, but I'm terrified of failure also. So yeah. I just take it on and like saying like, give me more. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that really kind of helped me to understand my students more and when they felt like they were drowning. Mm -hmm. And um, ah, okay. so there was that. And now I can recognize when there's just too much for me and I know when to say, no, I'm done. Yeah. Um, this can wait till tomorrow. It doesn't matter if it takes an extra day to, for me to do yeah. X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter if I walk in tomorrow and I have to wing it. Like yeah. sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I know because even now sometimes I'll be walking in from my vehicle. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'll do that today. And yeah. so I've noticed that started to change a little bit where I'll change literally sometimes in the first conversation with a student. Like you can kind of, one thing I'm noticing now is you can get the sense of where your class is at. Mm -hmm. Like when they all walk in, are they all like dying? Are they all super whatever? Mm -hmm. You can kind of adjust and say, okay, I'm not going to get that much learning out of them today. How do I tune it so that maybe I can move things around so that I can try to get like the, the more meat of the stuff I'm trying to get across tomorrow. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. Absolutely. But, yeah. I don't really know where I'm trying to go with the whole practicum conversation and the drowning part, but I guess my main thing is one of the main changes for me is how much time teaching mm -hmm. takes so i guess like is there anything else that you would say for how you when you became a mom for things that you adjusted to to i guess help someone else who could potentially be in the same scenario of like how to manage the their teacher time better uh yeah i'm still working that out yeah. if i'm honest um and i just if anything it's about uh, giving yourself grace and mm -hmm. caring for yourself yeah because like at the end of the day, if you drop dead, mm -hmm. let's be honest, yep. they'll find someone else to put, yep. sit in that chair and stand in yep. front of that class and yep. they'll move on. Um, and so it's, it's really not that important. Um, you know, it, we have to stop taking teachers and putting them on this pedestal of you're superheroes and you're doing it for the kids. It's, really, <laughs> it's no, I'm, I mean, I love my students. Yep. I, I really do. Um, and I love the connections I make with them. And I'm really lucky that I get to do a job where I hang out with young people all day because yeah. they're way cooler than grownups, <laughs> flat out. Like even with their hokey dances and yeah. their like weird hangouts in the bathroom and stuff. Yeah. Um, I really still think they're way cooler than grownups. And I'm lucky to spend my time with them, but I'm not a superhero. Yeah. Um, I am not doing it for the kids. I yeah. do it for a paycheck because yeah. – it's a job yep. and I work really hard all day long and I, then I go home yep. and I work really hard to be a good mom yep. and sometimes that's really hard too, yep. <laughs> but that's a hat I can't take off. Mm -hmm. um, so if my teacher hat is getting late and I don't mean like, you know, there are times absolutely when things are really crazy and it's busy and like report card season. Yeah. I take yep. work home. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I have to really set rules with myself and say, nope, I'm turning it off. I don't answer parent emails on weekends. Mm -hmm. Flat out. Don't care. No. I don't care what your problem is. Yep. Um, I can deal with it on Monday. Yep. And I will eventually. Yep. I'll get to it. And um, it's just, it's one of those jobs where they, everyone kind of thinks that you're this like self-sacrificing, like throwing yourself into the dental lines. And sometimes I am throwing myself into a dental lines, let's yeah. be honest, but yeah. I'm, I'm not interested in being a saint. Well, and I find there's almost a lot of, we put a lot of guilt on each other. We do. We put a lot of guilt on each other for the things that we don't do and the things that we no longer do. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's, how do you think that guilt is transferred? Where does that come from? Like, I don't, because it seems it seems unique to this job. Yeah, um, I think it's very similar to the way that like women can sometimes be their own like gender's worst enemy, and like um, we will call each other names based on what we're wearing or who we're hanging out yeah. with, and these things like this whole like same like internalized self hate that just yeah. um teachers have decided to pick up as well and it works well for the system right 
They, well, they have us controlling ourselves now. It's, it's great. <laughs>Hey everyone, thank you all for tuning in. Really do appreciate it. Just wanted to say again, if there are any issues with professional conduct and or you would like to share your own story, experience, or have something you would like to contribute to the show, please do not hesitate to reach out at lucasrdclark97 at gmail.com or send a direct message on Instagram to at mrclarkafterdark. Hope you all enjoyed, potentially found something of use. And of course, please do not forget to subscribe. See you guys all next time. Unless you're scared.